Welcome everyone to Zoom into Books this afternoon. We have author Tom Boatman with us and guest interviewer Burke Allen. So Burke, take it away. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the Big Time Talker podcast on the Blog Talk Radio Network, Apple iTunes. Uh, it's everywhere, all over the internet, and it's a special joint venture with our friends at Zoom into Books from Headline Books. And our guest today uh, has published a couple of books, part of the Resetting Our Future series from Changemaker Books. Um, and uh, Tom Bowman is the climate guru. They call him the, the common sense climate guy. The books are uh, empowering climate action in the United States, and what if solving the climate crisis is, is simple? You can find them online at TomBowman.com. Tom, thanks for being here today. What if solving the climate crisis is simple is the title of the book, but it's really not simple, is it? Ah, there you go. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Sure, um, sure it's simple, but we've been taught to think that it isn't. And that's, that's what led me to write this book. Most of the people I know um, have learned about climate, climate change from scientists, and scientists are in the business of studying really complicated systems, the way the atmosphere and the oceans and the land and the biosphere and the, the cryosphere, which is the polar ice caps, all interact to create our climate. That's incredibly complicated stuff. And because they are the main vehicle for us to learn about climate change, we've been taught that it's very, very complicated. And we've also been taught that the things we need to do to reduce emissions are equally complicated. The good news is that that's just a particular way of looking at the problem. And we don't have to look at it that way. Tom Bowman is our guest today on Zoom into Books and the Big Time Talker podcast, powered by our friends at Speaker Match, world's largest online virtual speakers bureau. We're talking climate change and Tom at TomBowman.com, the common sense climate guy. All right, if it's so simple, what's the issue and why do we get these doom and gloom predictions? Yeah, okay, so let's get to the, the nub of the issue, right? Um, what I just described is, is this impression that climate change and the systems we need to change are so complicated, they're like this entangled Gordian knot. Right. So let's say I wanted to reduce emissions in the food industry. Well, I start pulling on that thread in this knot and pretty soon I'm pulling on food production, global transportation because food is global. And now we're dealing with energy systems that create the power to grow the food. And now we're pulling on international finance and consumer markets and brand management. And all of a sudden it's too big for me to think about. Right. Yeah. And it makes us all feel small. And it makes us think that some kind of technical elites are going to have to master plan a global solution. And we all know deep down that nothing really works that way. Right. That's the impression. And that's what keeps us feeling helpless. And the evidence from the polls shows that people really do feel helpless. But I had an art professor once who, who uh, I was working on a painting and I just, you know, everything I tried was a failure. I could not get it to work. And he walked up behind me. He looked at it and I said, what's wrong with it? He said, here's what you do. Hang it upside down, hang it on the wall and go home. Because when you come back tomorrow and you look at it with fresh eyes from a new perspective, you're going to know exactly what's wrong with it and what to do, right? Well, that's a, that's a strategy that we can apply to anything. If we disrupt and set aside the assumptions that are holding us back, now we can figure out, now we can see the opportunities that are before us. Hey, if you're watching on Facebook Live right now or on YouTube and you have a question uh, or a comment for Tom Bowman, please send it in. We'll be happy to, to post them. Uh, he is the Common Sense Climate Guy and author of these books from our friends at Changemakers Books, uh, part of their Resetting Our Future series. Uh, let me rewind a little bit. How does a young Tom Bowman get interested in this? You know, I, I see the guitars in the background as we do yeah. this video chat. And I think, all right, a young guy, he plays guitars because he's interested in girls. Uh, <laughs> being a climate guy is not necessarily going to be the thing that's going to attract members of the opposite sex to you in college. So how do you get into climate? Um, 
I got into it by accident, the way most people, a lot of people do. I, I used to own an exhibit design and project management company. So my company of about a dozen people would design train show, trade show exhibits, international air show exhibits, museum exhibits, exhibits for aquariums. And I was hired by the National Academy of Sciences to do a new museum in Washington, DC. And in that industry, uh, in the design and exhibits industry, to create a museum in Washington, DC, I mean- It's a big deal. It's a big deal. So it was a real kudo and, and a great honor. And the first exhibit was about climate science back in 2003. And I was being mentored by some of the most eminent climate scientists in the world. And I really had to learn what they were talking about if I was going to find a way to tell their story to average people, people like me who are not scientists, right? Um, and <clears throat> I remember thinking as we as we did that at the end, I asked the I asked the climate guy, uh, the climate uh, um, project manager, who was my mentor. I looked at the future scenarios and thought, "Aren't you worried about this?" And he said, "Well, yeah, but but humans aren't stupid. You know, we'll make wise decisions, and thank goodness we have some time." Well, just three years later, um, Scripps Institution of Oceanography has an aquarium. They're down in La Jolla, San Diego, California. And they asked us to do design their climate science exhibit. Uh, so I was working again with a group of very eminent scientists who were providing the, the content and reviewing, reviewing our designs. And I was struck by how the attitude in 2006 had completely flipped. There was this amazing sense of urgency because uh, China was suddenly developing really quickly and emissions were rising much faster than predicted. And because the polar ice caps were starting to melt much sooner than predicted. And I literally had a moment of epiphany that I write about in the book, What If Solving the Climate Crisis is Simple. Um, and it's one of those moments where, where everything about what's in our future sunk in all at the same time. You know, an, an epiphany is, is defined as an intuitive moment of intuitive insight into the reality of something. It doesn't right. have to be religious. It can be about anything. And for me, it was about climate change. And I, I mean, I was, I was so stunned. I could hardly breathe in this meeting. And, you know, being a business guy, you always want to be cool. Nothing's ever a problem. You got it. <laughs> and I, I sat down in the director's office. She said, is there anything you want to ask me? And I, I literally said, yes. How do you cope with knowing what you know? And that started me on this path. I mean, that you can't squeeze the toothpaste back into the proverbial tube when something like that happens. And it redirected my career. And I've been working with scientists and social scientists and entrepreneurs and others uh, ever since to figure out how we change our culture, how we engage our public in climate action. So I want to go back to the, the title of the book, which I think is fantastic. What if solving the climate crisis is simple? And Tom Bowman is our guest today. He's at TomBowman.com. So if it's so simple, why is there so much consternation, uh, not only here, but all over the world about, you know, how to take the first step and what the first step is. And, uh, you know, it, it devolves into this political infighting. I mean, if we all see the train is coming, should we not all be able to get off the damn track? If we knew what to do, we okay. could. And, and uh, when I hung the climate picture, our picture of the climate problem upside down, here's what I saw. There's only one thing we need to do. We need to stop burning fossil fuels well before mid-century. And we absolutely positively do not want to fail, right? That's all we have to do. Stop finding infinite ways to stop burning fossil fuels. Now, all of a sudden, we don't need a master plan for that. You can do it in your business. I can do it in my business. We can do it in our households in myriad ways. I did it, in fact, in my design firm, and we won a statewide award because we cut our emissions by two-thirds in just 15 months, and we saved money, and no one suffered. In fact, everybody was so thrilled by what we'd accomplished that it created this new sense of commitment and energy in my company. So, so this is amenable to us. And if we, if we adopt that mantra, stop burning fossil fuels well before mid-century and absolutely positively do not stop, it changes the way we think about what we want our government to do federally and locally and in our states. It, it changes the way we think about what we want our employers to do. And all of a sudden we can start building collective momentum in that direction. 
you know, uh, people see you on TV, they hear you on the radio, they hear you on these podcasts all over the place. You're always talking about this. Yeah. Um, but there will be people, Tom, who come back to you and say, okay, if we stop burning fossil fuels, this is how I put food on my table. This is how I make a living. I work in one of the extraction industries. You know, I'm, I'm in the oil and gas business. I'm in the coal business. Um, uh, you and I have talked before uh, about, you know, my upbringing in, in the coal fields of Appalachia. Sure. You know, that, that takes food off people's tables literally and causes mass migrations and drug abuse and mm. abject mm. poverty. And, and this is nothing new, but but uh, you know, are we are we trading one bad thing for another bad thing? Well, it depends on whether we're smart about how we manage it. Uh, I think um, okay. you know we live in a world, we live in an economy, an economic system that that doesn't reward stability, right? New technologies come along and disrupt old technologies. I mean, when the first Mac computers came out and compact computers came out who thought they would become what they are today, right? And think of all the businesses that had to evolve and the businesses that disappeared because of it. Um, this happens all the time. There's no, there, there tends not to be enough of a safety net when, when our economy fundamentally changes. So what do we do to support the people, as you said, in Appalachia and coal country and the extraction industries who, who are gonna have less work if we shift away from a fossil fuel economy. That's up to us to help with, I think, as a society. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm never impressed when people say we need to provide job training. That doesn't help you if there's no job. <laughs> That's right, yeah, and, and you know, how do you feed your family while you're getting that training? You gotta right. work. Right, and, and yet the change is coming. We, let's, let's be clear, Ford last night released the all electric F-150 pickup truck which is by far the best selling vehicle in the United States. I mean, it's right. worth the sales of every other vehicle. Now that that's happened, the barn doors are open, right? Before it was Tesla and it was niche markets and they were there and it was the Nissan Leaf, but all of a sudden the F-150 all electric and, and people are gonna love what it does for them, how much better it is for them. Um, this is already happening in the energy production bit side of of our economy, it's happening in in corporate world and many other ways. As this unfolds, there is likely to be less work in the extraction industries. And so the question is, will Biden's infrastructure plan, for example, um, provide the kind of, of uh, blue collar and white collar jobs that will fill that gap? Um, it seems inevitable that some people will move. Uh, out of their communities. But, but if I were in government, my job, I think, would be to attract businesses to the communities that, have, that need to have an economic change, right? In other words, if you work in an extraction industry in Appalachia, who's making the effort to attract other industries into Appalachia that, that the people there would want to have? Um, this goes on all the time. Elect I've worked with electric utility companies and they, they have these energy education centers all over the country and they use them to attract businesses into their surface territories. And they offer, you know, they're coordinated with the government. So you get tax breaks, you get all kinds of advantages to move your business into town. This is what we need to do, I think, to, to shore up the economies and, and create vibrant new economies in places that have been dealing with fossil extraction industries for so long. You know, you hear a lot about uh, carbon capture, and clean mm -hmm. coal, and, and those sorts of things uh, as, as sort of a, a bridge, I guess. Yeah. The fact of the matter is, it's my understanding that that technology doesn't actually exist yet. Uh, you know, it's sort of a pie in the sky kind of thing. Yeah, you know way more about this than, than I do. So, so what say you to you know clean coal and carbon tax uh, capture technology? Is that yeah. part of the answer? Well, well, coal is not clean in the first place, um, right. right? I mean, and it causes all kinds of health and pollution problems. Um, and by the way, um, the coal industry is automating so quickly that jobs are disappearing anyway. Um, from that industry. So it has been for years since I was a kid. Years, and that will continue. So um, uh, the idea of 
of carbon capture and storage is that you capture the carbon that comes out of a power plant smokestack and you bury it in deep underground in geologic formations like empty oil fields, right? And, and the, the assumption then is that that CO2 is going to remain underground for thousands of years and not leak out. And as long as it does, that's fine. But if it doesn't, <laughs> then we have a problem, right? The technology is in the demonstration phase. There are some coal capture, capture and storage uh, facilities in the world, and they're sort of proving it, but it's expensive. It doesn't apply everywhere. Um, and really, the smarter answer is to leave the coal in the ground in the first place. A lot of coal miners would disagree, and miners' families. And, and I, I'm going to give you an opportunity right now to speak directly to those folks who are, are watching, listening, and, and they're saying, this guy wants to ruin my way of life, my father's way of life, my grandfather. You know, it's a generational thing. Right. Uh, they, they've right. been in the oil and gas business. Uh, they've been in, in the extraction industries. And and you're saying, look, it's going to stop. You're in the buggy whip business. Right. Uh, you know, you're in the typewriter business. You've got to make a change. But, but what do you say to those people who see their livelihoods literally slipping away? Um, <clears throat> I say a couple things. First of all, the world is changing whether we like it or not. And, and the consequences of climate change are truly horrific if we, if we let this go unchecked. The markets are also moving away from coal in the United States. You know, the industries are, are not thriving because of, largely because of fracking. The electric, electricity industry has shifted to natural gas in a big way, right? And, and it's not going to go back to coal for a whole variety of market reasons that none of us have control over. So that's the downside. That's the horrible part for people whose, whose jobs depend on it. The upside is um, that we can replace th those jobs. We're going to have to do it together. It's, I mean, I, I wish I could say it's easy, um, but it's not easy. Right. I mean, we have to move uh, alternative industries into places where people live so that they're not dragged out of their communities. And one of the reasons that I think that that Biden wants to go really, really big on the infrastructure bill is because it's a job generator. It's a really big job gen generator, two trillion dollars to rebuild infrastructure. That means not just job training for jobs that don't exist. It means literally rebuilding roads and bridges and building out internet access and building the green, um, you know, the charging station infrastructure and all the kinds of things that, that are going to replace coal energy jobs with clean energy jobs. Um, and I can tell you, you know, I live in California and people either love or hate California, depending on, on your point of view. But even during the Great Recession of 2010 to 2012, the one sector in California's economy that was growing was the green jobs sector, even in that downtime, um, because there's so much need for solar and wind power and for the for the gener you know the transmission infrastructure, making a smart grid. These are not these are not bad jobs. These are really really good jobs, um, and with those kinds of investments. Those jobs can will be needed all over the country in every community. And I think that maybe is the key. You know, you talked about that that Ford F-150 electric vehicle, um, which oh. the, the introductory pricing is commensurate with the gas Ford F-150. Why, why, Tom, can't those trucks or the batteries for those trucks be built in the Midwest, in Appalachia, in some of these communities? Right. Why can't government incentivize... Ford, for example, to push those in there. Look, we're going to shut down your your uh, fracking facility. We're going to shut down your your oil well. Why can't we push those you know uh, green energy jobs into those communities? That's exactly right. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Right. It, once consumers find out how great it is to own an electric truck, that that um, you never have to do a tune up, you never have to do service, you never have to stop at a gas station, right? You never have to have a lube job it doesn't wear out very fast um, and it's fun to drive and it's can haul more weight and it's got more torque and it accelerates faster. Um, this is the kind of thing consumers are going to start to jump on and contractors are going to jump on it because it's robust. That means there's going to be a lot of them for sale and they got to be built somewhere. Um, 
And I think Biden's getting this part of his, his talk right. The made in America part of his talk is right. Not only do we need to build batteries and build the trucks, but there's a, a new company spun off from an executive at Tesla called Redwood Industries that's, that's saying, you know what? We actually need to take all the old batteries from cell phones and computers and old cars, and we can completely take them apart and take all the materials out of them and build brand new batteries, and then you don't lose anything. And so it's a, there's another battery supply chain in the used batteries just to keep rebuilding them and rebuilding them. That can happen anywhere in the United States. Doesn't have to happen in China. Tom Bowman is our guest today. He uh, has written a couple of books. You see him there behind you if you're watching on, on Facebook Live or on YouTube, if you're listening to the podcast. Titles of the books are What If Solving the Climate Crisis is Simple? And uh, the new one is Empowering Climate Action in the United States. They're from Changemakers Books. And special thanks to Headline Books and Zoom Into Books for being our, our joint venture partner on uh, the broadcast today. Hey, you mentioned China. Hmm. So I've been to China. Masks were being worn in China before masks were being worn here for the pandemic. Well, sure. I got off the airplane in Shanghai and I couldn't see, you know, and I'm not exaggerating, 10 feet in front of me because pollution was so thick. Um, if China is going to ignore all of this yeah. and do what they're going to do because they're growing so rapidly... Uh, you know, are we just throwing a pebble in a really big lake and it's just not going to make a doggone bit of difference what we do here? Um, let's turn that question around. If okay. we don't do anything, what good is going to come of it? <laughs> right? If we do nothing and we're the biggest economy in the world by far, even California is the fifth largest economy in the world if it was a country all by itself. Our, our economy is huge and we're the number two polluter in carbon. And we historically, we for you know 100 years, we were number one in the world. If we get our act together, it's going to drive China to get its act together because our marketplace is so big that if we, if we use our economic power, it will have enormous influence over what China does. Um, and, and that's true for the rest of the world too. You know, there's a lot of talk that, that as we rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement, after President Trump pulled us out of the Paris Agreement, we don't have any credibility on the world stage. The world is moving on. America has lost its luster. There's all that talk, but that ignores the fact that we are as powerful as we are economically in the world. And, and that means, and, and Europe wants to decarbonize quickly. Um, they're going to be on board with us. So I, I, I sort of shift the premise of your question, Burke, to say, if we get our ad together, it not only gives us leverage, but it puts pressure on China to keep up that. And, and I think they want to do it. I think they're sick. I mean, it sounds like they're sick and tired of the, of the really incredibly unhealthy air quality that they live with. Fair enough. Um, I'm not sure I buy the argument, but fair enough. It's well yeah. thought out. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm curious about um, this is hard work. It doesn't mean it's going to be all fun and games. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm curious whether they would follow the lead or whether it would take a little more than than arm twisting on our part. Um, what about wind and solar? You, you mentioned the former president, who has a totally different take on things yeah. than the current guy in the in the uh, uh, corner right. office there. Right. Um, and, and, you know, he took lots of swipes at wind and solar. What happens if the wind doesn't blow? Uh, you know, what, what happens on rainy days? And, and I remember uh, when it snowed, I, I'm here in Washington, D.C., it snowed here once, and, and he said something about, well, uh, apparently global warming is not happening here. Yeah. Well, you know, and of course, he forgot the word global. You know, it's not, it's not right here in <laughs> Sure. But I mean, what say you? Because there are an awful lot of people, and frankly, Tom, an awful lot of smart people who say, you know what, uh, wind and solar is not going to replace what we have now. Now that's above my pay grade. It's not above your pay grade, though. So <laughs> give it to us straight. Yeah. Okay. Here's the story. Um, the 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 short answer is it never comes down to one thing, right? The, the cheapest and most abundant source of new energy is the energy we're wasting and we don't really have to use. If we all, I mean, that's how my company reduced its emissions by two thirds. All, all we did is eliminate waste that we were paying for and didn't see, 
right? And if we Give all- Give me some examples. Let me interrupt you. Give me some examples. Sure. sure. So, so a big part of our, we, we were measured by an independent third party because I, I wanted to learn from it. I wanted right. to know. Um, so here's what we did. And this is going to strike you as ridiculously boringly simple. But I was driving an SUV, small SUV as the company car. And I swapped it for a hybrid. And, and I didn't drive it as much. And that made a huge difference, believe it or not. Now, if you live up a dirt road somewhere in the country, if you live in coal country, don't worry. You need your pickup truck, <laughs> right? Yeah. You, need, you need a high clearance, robust vehicle where you Prius live. Prius is not going to cut well, it. That's right. A Prius won't cut it. So forget about that where you live. But if you live in a city, you don't need to drive a 4,000 pound vehicle around that you, is too big to park, you know? Um, and you don't need to be paying for the gas. Anyway, so that was one of the things we did. The second thing is that our air conditioner broke down on a hot August afternoon. And so I said to the guy who came to, to replace it, I want the most, tell me where the price point break is, where for every dollar I spend, I'm getting more efficiency. And after that, I'm just spending dollars for nothing. And he said, oh, it's right here at this level. It's real obvious. So we got the most efficient one we could afford. And then we took the advice of the utility companies. Um, we replaced all our lights with LEDs um, and we sh plugged everything into power strips and shut everything off at night so that the office was really off when we went home instead of using this, what they call vampire power, which is just sucking away 10% of your electricity bill for nothing. We, uh, we turned off, we replaced our copier, our lease expired and we got a multifunction machine and I told him to get an Energy Star one, so it would be energy efficient. And we found one that that did everything everybody wanted and, and designed for them. That's a lot. They want a lot. And but they got the Energy Star one, and they liked it so much that we turned everything else off. I mean, these are these are really simple things, um, and the result was a two thirds reduction in our emissions. So that just explains how much we're paying out of pocket every month for energy we don't need to spend. So that gets, let's say we reduced our, the United States emissions or by 25% just through efficiency. That means we need less wind, less solar, less coal, less gas, less nuclear, less of everything. Uh, and that's just smart stuff. The smart grid will allow rooftop solar everywhere to be feeding the, the grid everywhere, right? So sure, it may be raining where you are, but if it's sunny where I am at the same moment, we're generating electricity that you're using, right? And that's kind of how these interconnected grids are designed to work. So there'll be different solutions in different places and, and you add it all up and we move to cleaner air, better health, lower emissions, more stable climate and greener jobs. That sounds like a sales pitch, but it's actually the truth. <laughs> <laughs> The way you deliver it, it doesn't sound too salesy. It actually sounds like good common sense. So you, well done, sir. <laughs> uh, if you want to read more about this, uh, the books are not uh, War and Peace. You don't need to invest a month of your life to get through these books. They really are simple. What if solving the climate crisis is simple and empowering climate action in the United States are by Tom Bowman. Get them at TomBowman.com. That's B-O-W-M-A-N, TomBowman.com. He is our guest today. He's the common sense climate guy. Um, Tom, when, when you set out on this mission, you mentioned earlier in the conversation uh, that you had a, com uh, a talk with a climate scientist and you said, you know, how do you, essentially, how do you get through the day knowing what you know? Right. Now, I don't want to be gloom and doom here, but you obviously learned something that woke you up and changed the trajectory of your life and your career. True. If, we don't do anything, what's going to happen and how quickly is it going to happen? Uh, uh, the $64 question. Um, so it's already happening. First of all, uh, we're already experiencing in the West wildfires like we've never seen before. Uh, in Alaska, they're having wildfires and they're in Siberia, they're having wildfires. And this is the frozen North and it's been 70 degrees in in the Siberia, you know, the gulag, 70 degrees, that makes no sense. Um, we're experiencing more flooding, more intense storms. Um, in parts of the world, uh, the ability to, part of the reason we have a wave of immigrants walking from Central America, from places like Honduras, 
all the way north across Mexico to our southern border is because it's become almost impossible to work outdoors and farm. And so those people flood to the cities and guess what? There's too much violence and exploitation and they feel like they have to leave. So we're already seen, seeing uh, climate migrations. So it's underway. The future, if we do nothing, good Lord, coral reefs will all be dead. And that's a huge nursery. Not only do we lose beauty, we lose the, the, the breeding grounds for all kinds of fish that we eat. Um, we lose the forests because they burn and because pests spread northward and kill the trees. We lose um, our coastlines because the oceans rise and, and the first thing that happens is that the waves erode and pound away at our cities and towns and infrastructure that's along the coast and, and the water gets into our aquifers and taints our aquifers. We experience more drought in the Southwest, which means we have a water shortage that won't go away. Um, it we, means we experience more migrations, food productivity declines. These are not, this is like a horror show description, right? This is real dystopia. This is Mad Max that people sort of describe. And how fast does it happen? Well, it's unrolling all around us. Um, and there, the scientific studies about how fast various pieces are, will happen are, um, our hard work that's being done. Like I said, this is a complicated, the climate system is very complex. But the thing that is, if you step back for, for a minute and you, and you look at the trend in the science reporting, time after time after time, you see, wow, we're surprised this is happening so quickly. This wasn't supposed to happen for another 30 years and it's already happening today. I would say by 2050 or 2070, the, the lifespan of people's kids today is going to be a very, very, very different world and not one that any of us want to see. Um, so, so that's the warning. The good news is, would you like to live in a world where there's no smog? I sure would. I grew up in Southern California choking on smog alert air. Um, and to never see smoggy day again would be worth its weight in gold to me. Um, would you like to, to live in a world where um, there's no, there's less water pollution and all of, you know, people's kids don't get asthma so much. You don't have to take them to the emergency room so often. That's the prospect of a world where we stop using fossil fuels all the time. Is there a point of no return? Is there, you know, a, a stake you can put in the ground and say, look, if we don't do X by the year Y, it's too late and we may as well do nothing. <laughs> um yeah, there's there's a couple ways to look at that. One is that's never too late to try because it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. But yes, there are tipping points. Tipping points are the points at which some process in nature has gone over an edge and you can't stop it anymore. It's just going to cascade. And there are scientists who believe we've already reached a tipping point with Antarctic ice that it's going to melt. But now it may take many centuries. And as it melts, it's going to raise sea level and Florida is going to disappear gradually. But that might take 500 years or it may happen sooner, you know, and and it doesn't all have to happen before Miami's in trouble and Tampa's in trouble and things right. like that. So, um, so yeah, there are, um, there are lots of tipping points in nature. We don't know really where, the scientists don't really know where they are. They know that they're fast approaching. So the International community has said, hey, we want to limit warming on a global average basis to one and a half degrees Celsius. And we're halfway there already. Um, and two degrees is the point at which we think, boy, it would be really terrible. There's real consternation among politicians as to whether we can get to 1.5. And uh, the Paris Agreement says two degrees, limit it to two degrees. That's That's a decision by world leaders. It's not there's, there's a scientific basis for saying, yeah, it does get a lot worse beyond that, but it's a, it's a sort of an arbitrary stake in the ground. So clearly you're in favor of uh, rejoining the Paris Climate Accord. You think that's a good thing? I think it's a good thing. It reconnects the United States to the rest of the world in ways that give us leverage and influence. Yes. Before we run out of time, Tom, I want to talk specifically about the books a little bit. So 
if someone's watching right now on Facebook Live or YouTube or they're listening to the Big Time Talker podcast on iHeartRadio or Audible or all the million places you can get podcasts now, and and they think, hmm, what if solving the climate crisis is simple? If I pick that book up, what am I going to get out of it? Uh, one uh, climate expert I I know described it as a as a primer on how we solve the climate crisis. Another one wrote to me and he said, you move people from despair to hope in just a few hours with this book. Hey, that's pretty special. And I, it's pretty special. And that was what I was trying to do. And it's all grounded on, on real research and what I've learned from experts in lots of different fields. So it is, other friends have told me this is the, <laughs> I know somebody, a colleague who bought 50 copies to give away as Christmas presents. She said, it's the only optimistic book I've ever read about the climate crisis. So that's, that's the way to think about that one. All right. Yeah. And, and empowering climate action in the United States, which is uh, uh, the one with the red cover. The other one is the blue cover. So I like that you've got the red, white, and blue happening. Empowering <laughs> climate action in the U.S. What will people learn there? So last year, I was involved as a lead writer in a project that brought about 200 climate experts together from all and climate justice, ex, you know, people who work on, on racial equality and climate justice and environmental justice, education, uh, economics, social science. They all came together to talk about one of the requirements of the Paris Agreement, which is, is to come up with a national strategy to empower communities and people to to find their own solutions that work for them. And it was an absolutely remarkable transformational kind of experience. When you, when you meet people who work in radically different circumstances all across this big diverse country and they share their perspectives and their knowledge and their wisdom, you think, holy cow, we have enormous capacity to make our communities better. We just need to knit it together in strategic ways. And so the book contains a report that is a summary, that's a, essentially a summary of what these, this group of people, their vision for the future and what they recommend for how government policy can change and corporate policy can change to empower people and local communities to, to make climate decisions that work for them. Why, Tom, do you think there is uh, so much pushback on your point of view, and, and not specifically your point of view, but yeah. you know, uh, climate change people uh, that, that are involved. Uh, you know, you're, you're for certain folks in the political world. You know, you're ripped constantly. Oh, they're they're tree huggers, and they don't live in the real world. And right. so, so, and and I'm not talking about two or three people who think this. So when you talked about uh, right. your latest book, you talked about you know working with these different people and and in different areas who bring different expertise. There are also a whole lot of different people out there who are uh, totally blowing off what you have to say and, 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 you know, don't buy into it. And I wonder if, uh, as a guy who lives this, breathes it every day, mm -hmm. why do you think that is? Why is there so much pushback on something that scientifically, if you, if you believe the science, mm -hmm. you know, is, is inevitable, if we don't do something, we're all uh, up a creek without a paddle. Yeah. Well, first of all, the science is science. Science is evidence and conclusions based on evidence. And 90s, do you know how many, what percentage of the science, climate science community believes that human caused climate change is happening? What would you guess? Uh, you, wait, it's not the cows that are just belching out? The, yeah, it's not? Yeah. If you ask most know. people, they think it's sort of 50 50, right? They've been taught in the right. media that it's 50 50. The answer is 90, about 97% of climate scientists are convinced based on the evidence that human caused climate change is happening, right? Why is there this discrepancy? It's largely because there is a very well-funded, long-standing disinformation campaign that's, that's well-documented, that's funded by Chevron and Shell and the other oil companies. Um, and, and the Koch brothers who are ideologically libertarian and they don't want government getting involved in the energy sector or in our lives. So, so those who want government to stay out of the way and those who want uh, the fossil fuel, their vested interests to thrive have been pumping, you know, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars into lots of strategic ways to keep us thinking that this is either nonsense or insolvable or that the solutions are worse than the disease. 
Okay. Uh, no you plug accident. in an electric. It's no accident that we're that we think this way. <laughs> if you plug in an electric car, but that electricity comes from a coal-fired power plant, uh, aren't we just chasing our tail here? Yeah. Yes. Um, and and a lot of people are plugging their cars into rooftop solar to charge them at night. Um, the energy mix is changing, but in some states, it's still dominated by coal. And, and that's a fact. It's a changing, it's a changing circumstance, but it's a fact. So, so if your electricity system is all coal-based, you're better off driving a gasoline-powered car. Um, that may be true this afternoon, but in five years' time, it's probably not going to be true. You know, you uh, you bring this information with a smile, and uh, <laughs> and I ask you some pretty tough questions, and I appreciate your uh, your candor and your feedback because there are again a lot of people that, that would disagree, but I do think that a, a lot of people who are watching and listening might come away from this conversation scratching their chins a little and thinking this through a little bit more thanks to the conversation. So I appreciate you being here. Well, I'll, I'll leave you with one thought. And I learned this from a, from a guy who, um, and it came out of the blue, but it's never, I've never forgotten it. There was a, a talk going on and a philosophy professor set up and he was very frustrated. He said to the speaker, don't you have lots of ideas? And the guy said, sure, I have lots of ideas. I just don't believe any of them. <laughs> and, and this is an interesting idea, right? We should take everything we think is true with a grain of salt because there's always another way to look at the problem. And, and so for all everyone listening to this who thinks, yeah, no, it can't be true. Climate's impossible. We can't change. All I'd ask you is take that, take that view with a grain of, thought, of, of salt. Try hanging it upside down and see what you see. I like it. The books are Empowering Climate Action in the United States and What If Solving the Climate Crisis is Simple, which may be my favorite book title of the last year. The author <laughs> is Tom Bowman. You can find him online at tombowman.com. Thanks to uh, Changemakers Books, his publisher. Uh, the books are part of their Resetting Our Future series. Tom, thanks for being here today. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you, Burke. Thank you as well to our friends at Zoom Into Books, Kathy and Ashley, Belinda, the whole gang at Headline Books for hosting our Big Time Talker podcast. Thank you, SpeakerMatch.com, for sponsoring the show. Wherever you go, whatever you do, make it a great day. Thanks for being here. Bye, everybody.